I want to talk to you a little bit about biblical inerrancy and apologetics. I'm an atheist now. I was once uh, a fundamentalist Christian, uh, attended Bible college, began to notice a lot of discrepancies, inconsistencies, outright contradictions in the Bible. Sure, I believe the Bible is exactly what it is. It's the word of revelation to us from God himself. And the fact is that when people ask, do we believe all of it? You either believe it or you don't believe it. But in a greater sense, I think what the question tried to make us feel like was that, well, if you believe the part that says, go and pluck out your eye. Well, none of us believe that we ought to go pluck out our eye. That obviously is allegorical. God said it, I believe it. Well, what if God didn't say it? What if the book you take as giving you God's words instead contains human words? The New Testament was altered by the scribes who hand wrote each copy and in the process made intentional or unintentional changes. To act as though we all have to agree that every word of Holy Scripture is inerrantly accurate. I just don't see that's very productive. That, well, the Bible claims to be inerrant. It claims to be accurate. Every word of God is pure. Well, but that's its claim. Mm -hmm. So if it's not true when it says it's accurate, why would we believe any of it? Where does it say? No All wrong. scripture is given by inspiration of God, plain and simple. Welcome to Reasonable Faith, Conversations with William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and we hope you'll find the topics we discuss enriching and enlightening concerning the big questions of life. Dr. William Lane Craig is a noted philosopher and theologian known for his work on the existence of God, philosophy of time, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we invite you to discover the wealth of resources at reasonablefaith.org. There you'll find Dr. Craig's famous debates with leading atheists, articles, books, podcasts, audio from Dr. Craig's Defenders class, and a question and answer section featuring amazing questions people send us and answers from Dr. Craig. That's reasonablefaith.org, reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, let's talk about a very important topic. This is something that uh, skeptics of the Christian faith are interested in. And it is certainly something that people of the Christian faith are interested in, and that is inerrancy, the inerrancy of the Scripture, of the Bible. And let's start with a good definition in the event that uh, someone's not familiar with the doctrine. Well, I think definitions are absolutely crucial in how we understand this. The doctrine of inerrancy doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is literally true. It doesn't mean that everything the Bible says is true. What inerrancy properly understood means is that everything that the Bible teaches is true, or that everything that the Bible affirms to be true is true. In other words, does this uh, go into the area of, of the Bible's use of metaphor? If the Lord covers us with his wings, that doesn't mean that he's a bird. Exactly. That, that would it, be a it, wooden literalism? That would be, or interpreting apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation with all of its monsters and bowls and candlesticks and so forth, in a literal way would be to fundamentally misunderstand this kind of literature, which is full of symbolism and imagery. Uh, so it would be related to that, yes. Now, inerrancy is, is viewed as so important because if the Bible has mistakes in it, then how can it be inspired by God? That would be the claim. It, it depends, again, on what you mean by inspiration. I take that the doctrine of inspiration means that the Scripture, as it was originally written, was exactly what God wanted to be His Word to us, that what those human authors wrote under the guidance of God's Holy Spirit was His Word to us, and therefore is inspired in that sense. Now, whether or not inerrancy is an implication of that or not would be something that one might debate, but I think typically one would think that inerrancy would be a corollary of inspiration because it is God's word to us and God is truthful, therefore whatever the Bible teaches or affirms is true. It yeah. is God's word to us. And this would also extend to the original manuscripts, the original writings, the autographa, and not necessarily the copies that have, of course. That have come down? That's right, because the copies can get uh, miscopied, 
and errors can creep in, and therefore one isn't claiming that any of these copies is inerrant. This is relevant in that best-selling books, like the one from Bart Ehrman and so forth, call into question the inerrancy of the Scripture and therefore say, this brings down the whole house of cards. Yes, Bart Ehrman's own evangelical faith was undermined, initially at least, he claims, by his abandonment of the belief in inerrancy. He had a strong view of inerrancy as a student at Moody Bible Institute and then Wheaton College, and when he went to Princeton to do his graduate work, uh, apparently he was doing the exegesis of a certain passage that looked to have an error in it, and he tried to think of all sorts of ways to interpret the passage so as to explain away this mistake, and apparently his professor returned the paper to him and said on it, maybe Mark just made a mistake. And Ehrman says this was like the scales falling from his eyes, that with that simple comment, his belief in inerrancy just began to collapse, and he thought, yeah, maybe the author just made a mistake. And the problem for Ehrman was that once inerrancy went, it was like the the finger in the dike being released, and the whole of his faith disintegrated. And I think there's a lesson in this, Kevin, and it's this. Inerrancy is a corollary of the doctrine of inspiration, and as such, it's important to the Christian faith. But it doesn't stand at the center of the Christian faith. It's not one of the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. If we think of our theological system of beliefs as like a spider's web, at the core of the web, where the center of the web is, there will be things like belief in the existence of God. That will be absolutely central to the web of beliefs. A little further out from that would be the deity of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. A little bit further out from that would perhaps be the penal theory of the atonement, his substitutionary death for our sins. And even further out than that, somewhere near the periphery of the web, will be the belief in the inerrancy of Scripture. Now, what that means is that if one of these central beliefs, like belief in the existence of God or the resurrection of Jesus, goes, if that part of the web is plugged out, the whole web is going to collapse because you take something out of the center and the rest of the web can't exist. But if you pull one of the strands out that is nearer the periphery, That will cause some reverberation in your web of beliefs, but it's not going to destroy the whole thing. And the problem with a person like Bart Ehrman, and I think many people today, is that they have at the very center of their web of beliefs, of their theological beliefs, the belief in inerrancy. So that if that belief goes, the rest collapses and they are really in danger of committing apostasy. They're they're teetering on the brink by having this belief be at the very center of their web of beliefs. And that, I think, is just clearly mistaken. If inerrancy isn't true, that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist, obviously. Or that Christianity is false. No, if inerrancy is not true, does that mean Jesus of Nazareth wasn't the second person of the Trinity, that he didn't rise from the dead, that he didn't die for our sins? Obviously not. So, Inerrancy is a doctrine that doesn't belong at the center of your web of beliefs. It belongs somewhere out near the periphery. And and therefore, what happened to a person like Bart Ehrman is the result of a misconstruction of his theological system. You seem to be saying that he, he set himself up, that we can set ourselves up. Yes. And he set himself up for a fall by having a, a disoriented theology if you will. If inerrancy, the doctrine of inerrancy, isn't true, doesn't that weaken the Christian faith? Isn't it a good evidence? Yes, I I think it does weaken it, because it would mean that you would have to be prepared to say that various scriptural authors have erred in things that they have said. And then the question would arise, well, where do uh, do those errors lie? And one would begin to have to look for these mistakes, and this would reduce your confidence and certainty in the teaching of Scripture. So absolutely, this is an important doctrine and uh, one that one would not give up lightly. The uh, debate often centers on inerrancy with skeptics of the Christian faith and those who are considering 
I've seen it go around for years and years just on inerrancy, and that often detracts from the person of Christ. Yeah, I think that's just a huge mistake, Kevin, because now what you're trying to make the focus of, of your evangelism is inerrancy rather than Christ, as you say. It's Christ that is the center of the gospel, and so he ought to be the stumbling stone not the doctrine of inerrancy. Inerrancy is an in-house debate for someone who is already a Christian. Okay, It's All an right. in-house argument about what corollaries are there to the concept of inspiration. Now, that is very important because, again, you can go off on a rabbit trail for years with a person on inerrancy. And it, again, it detract you from from the central truths of the gospel. It would actually here's here's the series. It would keep people from salvation, uh, well, which is just horrible. If people have to jump through the hoops of biblical inerrancy in order to become a Christian, you will actually prevent people from coming to know Christ by forcing the unbeliever to embrace this belief in order to be saved. Let me give you an example, Bill. A young man preparing to enter college. As he's going into his freshman year, he holds strongly to inerrancy, and his certain brand of inerrancy holds that every single thing that his NIV Bible that he has right there is uh, totally dead-on center, inaccurate, and even down to the numbers that it reports in categorizing things and in counting things in, in the ancient world. He gets to college, and he finds out that some of those numbers were rounded off and were not intended to be exact, but were, uh, according to ancient standards, a basic kind of a round-off or estimation, and that topples his faith. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, in a sense, because suddenly that view that he held gets kicked out from under him, and he can't tolerate that maybe the numbers were rounded off a little. Mm -hmm. What that would be, I think, would be an example of someone who misunderstands the doctrine of inerrancy. Uh, to think that, for example, rounding off is an error. And what one needs to tell that person is that's not an error. We use rounding off all the time. And similarly, paraphrase is not an error. If I paraphrase what we talked about today on the air, I would not give a verbatim transcript, but nevertheless, my paraphrase would be accurate. So those aren't examples of errors. That would be a misunderstanding of inerrancy. But I'm talking about something more radical, Kevin. Okay. I'm saying, suppose somebody actually did demonstrate an error in Scripture that, that, that really it really is wrong. It's, it's, it's a mistake. Does that invalidate the Christian faith? And I'm saying, no, it would mean that you'd have to adjust your doctrine of inspiration. You would have to uh, give up inerrancy of the Scripture— um, but it wouldn't mean, as I say, that Christ didn't rise from the dead. Uh, and it wouldn't even mean that you don't have good grounds for believing that Christ rose from the dead. So often Christian apologists give lip service to this idea that if you approach the New Testament documents as you would any ordinary historical document, that they are reliable enough to show, for example, that Jesus thought that he was the Son of God, that he did miracles and exorcisms, that he rose from the dead— But they don't really believe that because the minute somebody points out an error, they go up in arms as though to admit this one error would completely undermine the historicity of the records of Christ. And that's just false. No historian approaches his documents like that. Indeed, the the very task of the historian is to sift through the chaff and to find the historical nuggets of truth amidst the errors and mistakes that are typically found in historical writing. So what I'm suggesting is that if you approach the Scriptures as you would ordinary historical documents and you find in them mistakes, contradictions, and errors, that still wouldn't undermine the general historical credibility of the Gospels, for example, including things like the miracles and exorcisms of Jesus, his radical self-understanding, his resurrection from the dead. Those things don't hang on the affirmation of biblical inerrancy. So you're saying even if someone were to show an irreconcilable error or contradiction, that shouldn't undermine our faith. Right. Um, 
you're not saying that anyone's ever done that. No. I mean, there have been attempts. I'm kind of impressed, Bill, with uh, how well the Bible stands up under scrutiny. I mean, yeah. you know, because I've looked at the uh, the best cases uh, of alleged errors and so forth, and there do seem to be plausible explanations. There are some a lot of things we just have a sufficiency of data about. Yes, I think that's true. And so I'm not arguing for biblical errancy. I, I do believe in inerrancy myself properly understood. Well, Hector Avalos would, would, would get after you on that, and he did. He said, because he says, Bill Craig doesn't know if the saints who resurrected in Matthew 27, if that's historical mm-hmm. or if that's Matthew using apocalyptic language and, and so on. So therefore, you know, that undermines the credibility of the Bible. Yeah. Now, that, that passage in Matthew 27 is that at the time of the uh, the time of the crucifixion, that there were some not resurrections but revivifications of um, some saints who actually came out of the grave and appeared to people, mm-hmm. you know, and so on. Much like other resurrections or revivifications in in other gospel accounts, and whether that's historical or whether that's language to illustrate the profundity of it, we don't know. What was he accusing you of there? I'm not sure. I think it was just an attempt to try to embarrass me uh, by uh, pointing out something that would look like a a biblical error, which was really quite irrelevant to either the historicity of the crucifixion or the historicity of the resurrection. It's kind of a red herring, in other words? Right, it is. It's just a red herring to try to distract people. And I'm happy to say, with respect to this passage in Matthew that I'm not sure what it means. Uh, And that's perfectly consistent with believing in biblical inerrancy. Belief in biblical inerrancy doesn't mean that you understand everything. I don't understand the book of Revelation. Uh, When I read the book of Revelation with all these various symbolic figures and images, I'm not sure what it's saying, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that it's inspired by God or inerrant in what it it teaches that you, I'm not sure what it teaches. That's all. That's that's perfectly consistent. Scholars have given good explanations as well because I hear people jumping up and down right now. But um, uh, over this passage, uh, we're not saying that it's not authentic. We're trying to examine exactly what's going on and what the writer meant and so on. But very very good scholars have offered explanations as to what happened here and what it represented, and uh, that it was a representation of the first fruits from the dead of, of Christ, and and that we would expect phenomena like this to, to go on at such a profound event as the crucifixion and resurrection and things like that. So it's not just a knockdown error. It's well, just no, maybe I, we don't have enough not. data as to what's going on. I have, and for me, it's just a triviality. It, it's, it doesn't prove anything. I mean, this is a, a, an addendum to the crucifixion story of Christ. It's not part of the resurrection account. This is a part of the account of the crucifixion. Yes. And yet no historian denies the truth that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. So that even if you regard this as a piece of apocalyptic imagery on Matthew's part and not something that literally historically happened, nobody thinks it does anything to undermine the fact that Jesus of Nazareth died by Roman execution by crucifixion. So it's just a triviality. It is, as you said, a red herring. Bill, the best man, uh, the most conservative man on inerrancy and the most able defender of it uh, has got to be Norman Geisler. And um, he's even very encouraging uh, to people who are so disturbed at the longer ending of Mark uh, not being authentic and not being in the oldest manuscripts and things like that. And he just says, so what? Uh, So we have some extra material we don't quite know what to do with. Well, textual criticism helps us sort these things out. Yes, that's quite a different question than inerrancy. As we said before, inerrancy is the view that whatever the original scriptures, the original documents teach or affirm is true. But the question of textual criticism is what were the original documents? Well, an inerrantist is going to hold his Bible right there and if you point to something in that Bible he's holding, that King James or, or, or whatever, and say this wasn't in the earliest manuscripts, that's very disconcerting. Well, not to an informed inerrantist, Kevin. I mean, an informed inerrantist won't be upset by that. On the contrary, he'll be involved in textual 
criticisms because he'll be anxious to understand what the original text really did say, lest he be misled by accretions and copyist errors. So somebody like a Daniel Wallace, for example, who is a fine New Testament uh, textual critic at Dallas Theological Seminary, is an inerrantist, but he's also very much involved in establishing the original text of the New Testament. And he, like other text critics, would say the longer ending of Mark as well as the the shorter ending is spurious. It's a later accretion by some later author that the original gospel of Mark either ended with verse 8 of chapter 16 or else the original ending has been lost and not recovered. Let me just offer encouragement because I'm an inerrantist as well, and it doesn't bother me in the least that we have a longer ending of Mark that got in later. You know, it's interesting yeah. to me. And it, and it seems to kind of reflect maybe even some historical things that went on that kind of got in the margin and then got inserted into the text. Yes, no big it's deal. not really relevant to inerrancy at all, I don't think. Yeah. Well, okay, what's the bottom line? Let's, let's sum it up then. Uh, anybody who is a, a potential Bart Ehrman, and we love Bart, it's just that uh, it, it, uh, he did get uh, his legs kicked out from under him because of a, of a certain view that he held that got toppled rightly so, but then he threw the baby out of the bathwater if there ever was a case of it. Yes. So what we need to understand is that the doctrine of biblical inerrancy is a corollary of the doctrine of inspiration. As such, it is an important doctrine, but it is not a central doctrine to the Christian faith. You can be a Christian and not affirm it, and if one does give it up, it will have some reverberations in your theological web of beliefs, but it won't be destructive to that fundamental web of Christian beliefs because it stands somewhere near the periphery. Thank you, Dr. Craig, for spending some time with us. And thank you, the listener, for being here today. This podcast is available at reasonablefaith.org, as well as a wealth of audio, video, and written materials from William Lane Craig. People all over the world have benefited from the insights of Dr. Craig, and we invite you to browse our resources at reasonablefaith.org. Dot org. And when you give to Reasonable Faith or purchase our resources, you help us expand into more media and speaking events, taking Christ to a world of big questions. So be sure and visit us at reasonablefaith.org. I'm Kevin Harris. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Reasonable Faith with William Lane Craig. <laughs>